Hello, my name is Dr. Stephen Falchuk. I am a pediatric neurologist and epileptologist uh, at the Nemours Alfred I. DuPont Hospital for Children in Wilmington, Delaware. And I'm also faculty of the Sydney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University. I was asked to speak to you today about living with Sturge Weber, COVID, and the summer of 2021. Um, so first of all, regarding conflicts of interest, I have to say that I have nothing to declare in the words of Foghorn Leghorn. Um, uh, so what are we trying to accomplish? Um, I would like you to get two basic things out of this talk today. The first is to realize that you are neither the first nor the last generation to face a pandemic, but life goes on. Um, the next is to rationally consider the available information about the COVID-19 pandemic, the available vaccines, and how it all affects you. And to realize that no information is complete ever, really. There's always new things that are learned but that you do have enough information right now to start making some judgments and decisions. I put some 1920s uh, uh, clips here. This uh, is, you know, folks in the early 20s. And I put this here just to remind you that they were through a lot, that life looks like fun and games, but they, you know, uh, might have actually been a veteran of the First World War, or if not, um, just barely missed it. And um, they saw, you know, a lot of relatives lost in the 1918 flu pandemic. And yet life went on. And they, in fact, got back to having a fun time. And we all will, too. But we just need to be patient and need to do the right thing, as actually folks learned in 1918 as well. So let's take a little perspective. So plagues in history. So, you know, this you can go back as far as you want pretty much and find evidence of major, at least epidemics. Pandemics implies the whole world. So we really need, you know, more modern travel techniques for a pandemic to occur. But going back, you know, the Antonine plague or also called the plague of Galen in uh, Galen, sorry, in 165 uh, AD, the death toll um, was about 5 million in the Roman empire and the cause is unknown. It's thought that Roman soldiers in modern day Iraq, what was called Mesopotamia, brought this back with them. It isn't known exactly what it was. It's thought it could have been measles or even German measles, um, rubella, but whatever it was, it was devastating for the Roman empire uh, at that time. They survived, they lasted another, you know, 300 years or so before, you know, an enemy was within the walls of Rome uh, in the West. But nonetheless, it was a big uh, hurdle for them. The plague of Justinian was a uh, bubonic plague, um, and this uh, greatly affected the early Byzantine Empire. There was up to 25 million fatalities there, which when you consider what the population of the world was at that point, is a fraction of what it is today. This was a huge portion of the population. It was caused by Yersinia pestis, spread by the rat flea. Um, rats and fleas were unavoidable in uh, early uh, urban settings. Um, the Black Death uh, was also caused by Yersinia pestis and killed anywhere from 75 to 200 million people across Eurasia. Um, the first two, I don't think there were any real learning points that were gained from them. The Black Death, the one thing we got from this was the term quarantine comes from the Italian quaranta, which means 40. And in Venice, they decided that ships should quarantine for quaranta for 40 days in the harbor before being allowed to disembark. I have no idea how anybody survived that. But the thought was that, well, if there was plague on the ship, it would be manifest and everybody who would die from it would die from it within those 40 days of being holed up in the harbor. Uh, so in the Venetian Lagoon. Uh, so we still use this word today. There were multiple cholera pandemics. Now these were true pandemics. So um, in, by the 17th and 18th century, we had ships that were just good enough and just fast enough 
that they could spread an infectious disease across the globe without everybody dying on board before they reached their destination. So cholera spread from Asia throughout the world, um, and there were many cholera pandemics. But this one, the third cholera pandemic from 1850 to 1860, while it wasn't the worst uh, with a million fatalities, is caused by an organism, by the way, called Vibrio cholerae, which is uh, basically spread by contaminated water, uh, contaminated by um, uh, fecal matter. Uh, an English physician named John Snow discovered just by making a map of all the cases in the underserved area of London where he was working, that there was a cluster and they were all linked to a certain pump called the Broad Street Pump. He ultimately succeeded in getting the handle removed from the Broad Street Pump. And the cholera pandemic went away in that part of London. Um, in 1918, influenza um, epidemic uh, as well spread across the world. There were anywhere from 20 to 50 million fatalities and that was caused by an H1N1 influenza variant. The thing we learned from this the only thing they had to offer was that hygiene, social distancing, and mask wearing do in fact work. They're not 100% certainly, but they do work in decreasing the transmission and help keeping people safe. This is really a truly remarkable example in history because quite honestly, physicians and everyone in 1918 didn't know what was making them sick. Viruses weren't really discovered until the 1920s and the influenza virus wasn't discovered until the 1930s. So they didn't even know what it was that was making this happen. Uh, influenza comes also from the Italian meaning under the influence. They thought it was bad vapors in the air and stuff like that. They, they had the germ theory of disease by this point, but they couldn't identify a bacteria. The only germs they knew were bacteria um, and funguses, and they, they couldn't identify anything that was, that was causing this to happen. But Anyway, they did an amazing job, and this could have been much worse, but hygiene, social distancing, and mask wearing were the only defenses that they had to offer. They didn't even have ventilators and mechanical ventilation or oxygen supplementation. <coughs> HIV and AIDS um, is an ongoing pandemic in slow motion. Um, from about 1980 to the present, it peaked. Uh, worldwide between 2005 and 2012, and thus far, somewhere around 36 million people, which, by the way, these are all obviously gross estimates from the World Health Organization. We don't really know. You know, the Romans had some uh, statistics that they kept, but, uh, you know, not all that great. This here is uh, probably a little bit more accurate, this 36 million. Um, this caused a lightning-fast advent of antiretroviral therapies. So this really sort of kicked our public health efforts as well as in prevention, as well as disease fighting therapies into high gear and helped open the door for the modern era. The COVID pandemic, we really don't know how many folks are going to expire from this. It's probably not gonna be anywhere nearly as bad as some of these others, but nonetheless, the case rates are high. And honestly, from our point of view, even one unnecessary death is bad. It's not needed. Uh, there's been some terrible statements that people have made um, publicly about, well, you know, the only people who are seem to be dying are, you know, uh, in a certain category. And so, you know, we can't shut down the whole economy for that. Well, mm, you know, the, the ethics of that start to become very questionable. Nonetheless, this is bad. I think it can be managed. We have not only what they had in 1918, which we know provably does work, but we also have now vaccine technologies, both standard vaccine technologies that have been developed as well as this new mRNA vaccine technology, which actually stems from the HIV uh, efforts. So the first mRNA vaccines uh, were experimentally designed more for uh, to fight HIV, but they do work against many different categories of illnesses. They haven't been effective yet against HIV. So Sturge Weber and the pandemic. Is there anything other than the obvious fact of a pandemic that has a mortality rate to it that you need to worry about? So again, going back to the 1920s, some of the images that I showed or some of the illustration of the images, mask wearing, Someone here is saying, wear a mask. This is the Seattle City Police, all masked up. We've seen this 
happened already in our time, and it happened in the 1920s as well. Um, or, I'm sorry, 1918 as well, I'm saying 1920s. Um, verifiable facts about SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. So, um, uh, first of all, these are acquired mainly by the respiratory route and droplets of various variable sizes. While I'm not advising people to go around licking doorknobs, we overestimated at first the concept of surface sanitation and surfaces being the way this is born. It really needs to be inhaled, it seems, uh, in a uh, sizable quantity uh, as the most common way of, of getting it. Other than that, you know, touching, you know, contaminated surfaces and then rubbing your eyes, you could probably get it that way. Um, eating, probably not so much. Putting fingers in your nose or in your eyes, though, definitely could be a method. It causes mainly respiratory and GI symptoms for the vast majority of people, but it can provoke a drastic immune response in both the young and um, of any age group, uh, young and old, um, that can be fatal. Um, it has been associated with abnormalities in blood clotting and abnormalities in the linings of blood vessels, as well as cardiac function and neurologic function. These can be fatal, but something doesn't have to be fatal to be a major problem for you. And some of these issues can leave major disability or other uh, long uh, rehabilitation uh, time illnesses behind in their wake. Most people who do get um, COVID-19, uh, the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2, will recover fully. Um, risk factors for worse outcomes definitely include advanced age, diabetes, autoimmune disease, um, pre-existing autoimmune disease, that is, uh, overweight status, chronic pulmonary disease, and sickle cell anemia, as well as a few other things. There is nothing at all that has been reported specific to Sturge Weber syndrome and COVID-19. As far as we know, which is not to say that the final chapter has been written, but as far as we know, having Sturge Weber syndrome doesn't put you innately in some higher risk category for complications of COVID-19. Comorbidities that the CDC does classify as risk factors for severe COVID. We already talked about a few of these pre-existing cerebrovascular disease, stroke, or um, uh, sometimes what they call TIAs, transient ischemic attacks, uh, other causes of vascular compromise, um, perhaps even something called Moya-Moya syndrome, which can occur uh, in many situations. Um, children with certain underlying conditions, chronic kidney disease, COPD and other lung disease, diabetes mellitus type 1 and 2, Down syndrome, heart conditions, HIV, neurologic conditions including dementia, obesity, pregnancy, smoking, sickle cell disease, solid organ or blood stem cell transplantation, substance use disorders, and use of corticosteroids and other immunosuppressive medications. So going back to this one, so you would say, well, Sturge Weber does have these vascular anomalies. This is more, though, um, cerebral arterial disease, and it doesn't seem to translate to what's happening with Sturge Weber. Um, I can't explain otherwise, but it does not seem to have the same implication in individuals with Sturge Weber as more older individuals with stroke. Possible risk factors supported by mostly case series, case reports, and if other study design, uh, the example size, the sample size is too small, include cystic fibrosis and thalassemia. Um, possible risk factors, but evidence uh, is mixed, include hypertension, uh, immune deficiency syndromes, and liver disease as well. This is all by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So what are the chief neurologic concerns of COVID-19? Stroke is the biggest one, 0. 0.4 to 2.7%. Encephalitis with encephalopathy spectrum, uh, the incidence seems related to severity of illness, age, and other factors. Posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome due to renal failure or hypertension has also been identified. Um, cerebral vein thrombosis, this can occur, but it seems very small. 
um, intracranial hemorrhage. Um, these are mostly hemorrhagic version of previous ischemic stroke, again, mostly in the adult population uh, with other um, uh, ischemic cerebral artery disease, atherosclerosis. Exacerbation of underlying conditions such as multiple sclerosis, myasthenia gravis, epilepsy, and dementia, anosmia, dyscusia, and then there's something called MISC-C, which is an autoimmune uh, inflammatory disease that's seen in children uh, primarily. Um, MISC-C basically has some overlap with something called Kawasaki disease and also just generally severe COVID-19, but includes inflammation in small vessels, including in the lungs, intestines, the heart itself, and in the brain. Um, so these are all concerns for um, COVID-19. Um, again, with Sturge-Weber, the thing that sort of would stand out most would be the stroke risk, although we're not seeing any particular um, risk affecting uh, Sturge-Weber patients that we can identify as of yet. Um, so the concerns most pertinent to Sturge-Weber, obviously, epilepsy, the vascular complications, and at this time, really doesn't seem to be any other suggestion for other specific risk factors that would put someone with Sturge-Weber in a higher risk category for complications of COVID-19. So there really hasn't been a whole lot of um, uh, great information about, you know, how much more increased one's risk is. However, this article here um, did seem to indicate that um, of patients admitted to uh, a, a set of emergency rooms, um, those with active epilepsy seem to have a higher fatality rate um, and also just a higher incidence of infection in general. And if those epilepsy patients had hypertension, their incidence of a fatal outcome was 2.8% was 2.8 times, I'm sorry, higher. Um, they were 2.8 times more likely to have a fatal outcome. Um, <clears throat> however, when you look at the statistical significance of this, there really was no provably significant difference in the case fatality rate. It was a 33% versus 8% case fatality rate difference. But that did not fall within statistical significance because this is an extremely small number of patients, and this is actually a small sample size. So it's hard to draw reliable conclusions. Nonetheless, to err on the side of caution, one would assume that having epilepsy is something that might inspire you to be more cautious about contracting COVID-19. Um, Vaccines for COVID-19. So both newer and older technologies have been uh, applied already, okay? So newer technologies are these um, mRNA technologies. The older technologies basically involve training your immune system to recognize proteins associated with the virus and to form antibodies against them and attack them. So these are all in production right now. Um, the ones in the United States that are most in favor are the uh, mRNA technologies, um, and those include, um, can, can we pause for a moment, uh, Julia? Yes, for sure. <coughs> Perfect, go um, ahead. Uh, I have to, I got an incoming call, so that's going to uh, hold on just a moment. I guess we can resume. Okay. So in the United States, of course, as you know, right now, Moderna and, um, all right, so pause again. Hang on just a moment. I this a third time. Um, uh, I think you're all set. Okay. All right, go ahead. So right now in the United States, um, the brands that are using the newer technology, uh, the mRNA technology, include the Johnson & Johnson and Moderna. I'm sorry. Damn it. Did it again. All right. One more time, Julia. Sorry. I don't know what's wrong. Um, in the United States right now, the ones that employ the mRNA technology are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Other vaccines, including Johnson & Johnson, are using a different, uh, the um, uh, 
uh, virus um, protein particle technology. All are designed to educate the immune system, though, in advance of an actual infection. Uh, what they do is they allow rapid identification and neutralization of the virus so that Fulman infection, infection and the resultant runaway immune responses from that infection do not occur. That's all they're trying to do. They're trying to basically not stop the enemy at the gates, but stop the enemy shortly after they've entered the gates before they cause mayhem throughout the city, if we use that analogy. Um, contrary to what some people have um, questioned, there's no risk of altering human DNA with the mRNA vaccines. And this is just because you don't have an enzyme called re reverse transcriptase. You cannot take mRNA and convert that into DNA that goes into your cell's uh, uh, nucleus. So um, there's no risk of that happening with uh, these vaccinations. However, of course, as with every other thing in life, there is always some risk involved with any immune-mediated process, whether it is an infection or a vaccine. But the question you need to ask yourself is, for you, which risk is worse when it comes to COVID-19, the wild-type infection or the vaccination? Um, so known complications for the vaccine chiefly are limited to injection site pain, which having gotten it, I tell you is, yeah, it's sore. Uh, fevers, chills, aches, and fatigue, which I had as well myself, uh, which occur for a limited period of time and then self-remit after a day or two. There have been rare thrombotic events associated with both the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca vaccines, including cerebral vein thrombosis. These have been a very low incidence though, and when you look at the statistics, much lower than the incidence cited of cerebral vein thrombosis with the uh, wild type infection, which I'm trying to get um, back to where that was here. Um, so this is much less than that 0.08% risk. Um, there, is, there are no known unique neurologic complications thus far from the vaccines themselves. So the vaccines do not seem to be causing any sort of encephalitis or meningitis. Um, there have been a few isolated case reports thus far as of the time of this um, talk of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Guillain-Barre syndrome is an attack on the peripheral nerves, which can be caused by any infection or immune process. So vaccines are not of course, going to be exempt from that. The Ambaré occurs a couple times a year with influenza vaccinations as well, too. Um, it is treatable, um, uh, but other than that, there are no uniquely neurologic complications that seem to be specific to the COVID vaccinations of any sort. Um, there is absolutely no information available on these vaccinations and Sturge-Weber syndrome, however. How about immune conditions? Okay, so immunocompromising conditions that may adversely impact vaccine response include the use of acute chemotherapy for cancer, the existence of active hematologic malignancies, stem cell, uh, hematopoietic stem cell that is, or solid organ transplants, untreated HIV infection with CD4 cell counts less than 200, combined primary immune deficiency disorder, and use of immunosuppressive medications such as um, mycophenolate or rituximab or high-dose prednisone, all can potentially decrease or even completely abort your ability to form the necessary immune response to the vaccine. So folks with these situations in play should think about the vaccine, not so much from it causing harm, but from the point of view of it being um, uh, futile that it might not take. Um, how about specific experiences with these vaccines? Okay, so there have been very rare vaccine-associated anaphylaxis reactions. Anaphylaxis is a, an allergic response where you get a rash that looks like hives. Your uh, tongue and your throat begins to swell. You may have difficulty breathing. Uh, this is the same that you can get from a bee sting or from penicillin or aspirin if you're allergic to it or shrimp or shellfish. They've been very, very rare with the mRNA vaccines, 
um, you know, so lo such a low incidence that it's hard to sort of cite a percentage to them. Uh, the risk of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia has been associated with both the Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca um, vaccines, um, causes of thrombosis associated with thrombocytopenia. Um, these cases seem to have been associated with autoantibodies directed against the platelet factor 4 or PF4 antigen. These are similar to those found in patients with autoimmune heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Um, some experts have already begun calling this uh, vaccine-associated immune TTP or uh, immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia, VITT. There is also an association with myocarditis um, with the mRNA vaccines. So vaccine regulators in the United States and Europe have taken notice of this, that there have been very isolated cases of uh, some cardiac involvement with the mRNA vaccines of Pfizer and Moderna, Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, the cases reported mostly have been among uh, young uh, uh, adolescents or adult males. The onset generally was in the first week after vaccine receipt and after the second dose. Uh, most patients who presented for care responded well to very minimal medical treatment and have rapid sim symptom improvement. There have been no fatalities associated with this. And this uh, one uh, sort of series actually entails a total of five cases, um, two of whom had myocarditis, two of whom had pericarditis, and one was a 60-year-old woman who had known coronary artery disease who presented with some new exertional symptoms um, and um, what's called a stress cardiomyopathy. But all of these patients went on to do well and did not have a significant um, uh, de decline in function. Their symptoms were transient chest pain um, and uh, shortness of breath uh, in the other cases. Um, so putting it all together, for patients with Sturge-Weber syndrome, the risk for neurologic and vascular complications of infection with SARS-CoV-2 do seem to be far higher than the risk for complications from the existing vaccines, particularly the mRNA technologies. This is work in progress, and more information will become available. But for right now, is there, the question would be, is there any particular scenario that might pause one's intention to vaccination if one had Sturge-Weber syndrome? I would say that one condition, if you had a history of thrombocytopenic conditions where your platelet count has been low and it's thought to be due to immune disease of any form, then I would probably say maybe this is one where you might want to sit it out for now. This is only my opinion, however. I cannot back that up with scientific fact. And for everyone else, honestly, I think that probably the statistics and the odds favor vaccination as opposed to allowing yourself to remain susceptible to the wild type infection, and particularly with that lingering concern about the stroke risk, because we know that vascular disease in the brain is a feature of Sturge-Weber syndrome. And even though that's not been reported out yet, um, I think that that is a much bigger smoking gun than any of the things associated with the vaccine. Those uh, that form of reasoning, that line of reasoning and those facts are why the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with this state. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends COVID-19 vaccination for all children and adolescents 12 years of age and older who do not have contraindications using a COVID-19 vaccine authorized for use for their age. Um, and that's where it stands, and this is the advice I would stand by. Thank you so much for your attention.